Okay. So as people uh, keep coming into our session, uh, let's um, start and set some uh, brief uh, ground rules for the presentation. Welcome all to um, Flash Talks number six. We will be uh, talking uh, about or hearing about uh, five uh, uh, wonderful presentations related to intervention development and adaptation. My name is Cesar Escobar Vieira, uh, and um, I'm very excited about the work uh, we're going to hear uh, about uh, this afternoon. Um, so in general, um, we would like to have each presenter um, uh, presenting their work in uh, five minutes. Um, I will be timing that uh, on, my, on my end. You should be able to share your screen. Uh, and when it's time for you guys to present, I will uh, ask uh, yourselves to unmute. Um, after each presentation, uh, we, because of timing issues, we will allow uh, up to two questions per, uh, from the audience. But if people have more questions, feel, uh, feel free to um, include those questions in the chat and our presenters uh, might be able to answer those questions, those additional questions there, if that's okay. So why don't we go ahead and start with our first presenter. Uh, the presentation is entitled Feasibility, Acceptability, and Potential Efficacy of Pocket Skills, a Self-Guided Web-Based Dialectical Behavior Therapy Intervention for people with substance use problems. Alex, uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'll hopefully try to share and get this going. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, you can see it, right? Okay, okay great. So yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm. Uh, Excited to kick off this uh, session. Um, so my name is Alex Veroth, and I um, am here to present some findings from a completed trial, a recently completed trial of our DBT web app called Pocket Skills. Um, so just some background. Uh, we know that emotion dysregulation uh, underlies a number of different mental health and substance use concerns. And we also know that you know, dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT for short, can um, uh, can treat the emotion dysregulation that underlies these multiple conditions. Um, but access to formal DBT is incredibly limited because it's lengthy, resource intensive, and requires multiple clinicians. Briefer formats of DBT skills training are, are quite effective in reducing depression, suicidal ideation, and substance use in as little as eight weeks. But even then, digital formats remain really this largely untapped format of delivery, and, and so that's something that we want to change. So the current study used an updated version of a web app called Pocket Skills. In our study, the intervention was self-guided and it helps users learn more than 25 different DBT skills in four core areas. And there's additional skills related to addiction as well. Short videos uh, featuring Martha Linehan are incorporated and a chat bot facilitates discussion and practice. An earlier version and our own pilot trial have demonstrated some support for its efficacy, but we wanted to run the current study, which is a 12 week uh, waitlist controlled RCT with one group being delayed four weeks and then receiving the intervention as well. So it's sort of this like phase crossover design. Um, we sought individuals who met the following inclusion criteria. Uh, most notably, they had to have a they had to have some sort of present alcohol or substance use disorder and not be receiving any formal CBT or DBT interventions. We allowed certain things like psychiatry appointments, medications, uh, NA, AA groups, and supportive counseling um, as however. We had three main hypotheses. First, the intervention, we thought that the intervention would obviously be feasible and acceptable and usable for people with substance use concerns. Second, uh, we hypothesized that the immediate group would benefit, uh, demonstrate greater benefits than the waitlist group um, because they would have the app for a <laughs> period of time. Third, we expected uh, both groups to benefit over the course of the study. Um, and so we, we used a number of different metrics 
matrix to examine these hypotheses, um, especially the first one. And for the second and third hypothesis, I'm going to focus on six outcome measures. We, we have additional measures, but um, I'm going to just focus on six for the time being. Um, to reduce the number of comparisons, we're also going to look at just week four versus baseline and week 12 versus baseline, because these are most pertinent to the hypothesis at hand here. So here's the details regarding the sample, uh, which was predominantly female, cisgender, uh, heterosexual, and white. Um, they did meet for about three mental health conditions on average. Um, and in terms of our first hypothesis, the first thing we're checking is, you know, how many people started the intervention. So 94% of people who were randomized actually started the intervention. Uh, only two people asked to withdraw for specific reasons. Uh, we found that a further nine people did not use the app after the first day. So that left 87% of those who actually um, started the intervention. Only one third of those who started the intervention abided by our minimum recommendation of using the app twice a week, at least for the first month. However, we did find that 60% of the participants who were randomized did uh, spend more than one hour actively interacting with the website. And this captures different inputs, uh, clicks, uh, watching videos, um, any sort of interaction with the website gets recorded as a line of data. Here you can see some additional metrics uh, for hypothesis one. To equate measures, I converted everything to a percent on the scale. So higher scores are generally just better. Um, participants thought the app was credible and estimated a 58% improvement on average at baseline. There were also positive ratings for acceptability, which actually improved from week four to week 12. Um, the app was rated as pretty usable, uh, according to an official measure about, uh, about usability. Um, and finally, here are some engagement metrics that we pulled from the website. Um, here you can see that the average amount of time that people spent on the app, and this includes dropouts, was about two and a half uh, hours or 144 minutes. However, you can see that engagement did vary widely, right? And this happens for a lot of uh, digital interventions. Um, on average, people use the app for about 10 unique days, and there was a spread of about 40 days uh, uh, total. Um, on average, you can see here also that the immediate group, the, the group that got um, uh, access for a longer period of time actually also reported uh, more use and, uh, and more days of use, essentially. So that's consistent with the study design. Okay, for hypothesis two, we adjusted for baseline values and only found greater benefits for the immediate group uh, for two of the six outcomes, um, and that's depression and anxiety. We really we found this mostly at week four uh, in support of the waitlist comparison, but overall, this hypothesis support for this hypothesis was weak. Um, for hypothesis three, after adjusting for baseline values, we did find that both groups largely did benefit from the intervention. Despite not finding an interaction, substance dependence did decrease at week four and week 12. Additionally, we saw significant reductions in other outcomes, depression, anxiety, emotion dysregulation, functional disability, and also an increase in DBT skills. So this is good support for this hypothesis. Um, we also collected some qualitative feedback. I'm just kind of putting this on the screen, but we're going to look into this further. Um, but in summary, I think the results are quite positive. Um, I think it suggests that it's feasible and acceptable. I know that there are some engagement concerns here, and so engagement varied uh, quite widely. And we also need to understand whether that engagement was actually correlated with outcomes. So that's something that I'm kind of in the process of looking into. Um, DBT often relies on a group format, and so this is kind of unusual to give people sort of a self-guided uh, version. And so, you know, this was really kind of a, a, a pilot study to kind of understand would people actually use this app, but I really kind of want to test this using some more coaching formats or possibly even as an adjunct to uh, standard DBT as well. Um, so that's pretty much it. I will say thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alex. Uh, any questions from the audience for Alex? Alex, I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, um, things related to engagement. That is so um, that is so uh, crucial for these interventions. Um, did you guys have the opportunity to look at difference in engagement uh, by age groups or by device that they uh, accessed the web-based intervention? Good, good question. Um, I didn't look at the age yet, uh, but that's something I can consider in the in the follow-up analyses. Device, you bring up a good 
uh, question about device. So this this was uh, this website is accessible from any device that has an internet connection. However, we did actually have more issues with iOS devices, which is uh, which is interesting. We found that people had more trouble signing in on iOS devices. So I'm definitely going to look into that because um, the idea was that most people would use it on their phone, but most people ended up using it as a website on their laptop. Um, um, there was some smartphone use, but it, it wasn't, it's not exactly clear. And I think I can pull that information about where it was accessed from, but um, there was something unusual about um, this particular design and it, it's hosted on Microsoft Azure, which is more of an Android kind of compatible system. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's a good question though. I would look into that. Thank you. If uh, people from the audience have additional questions for Alex or any of the presenters, Again, please feel free to uh, include those in the chat um, and we'll monitor those uh, as we uh, move along. So let's move uh, to number, uh, number two, um, the results of a proof of concept randomized control trial of a smoking cessation smartphone app for non-daily smokers. And uh, Suzanne, Please take it away. Oh, oh okay. there you go. Yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are working at, out of the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital. And we developed a smoking cessation app for non-daily smokers and tested it in the RCT. And well, let me see. There. And the big question is why an app for non-daily smokers? Um, there are about 25% of the smokers in the US are non-daily smokers, and it's an increasingly prevalent smoking pattern and is characterized by actually having no nicotine dependence, which is usually the basis for smoking cessation treatments. And that means that to date, there's actually no evidence-based treatment for non-daily smokers. Uh, that doesn't mean that non-daily smoking is uh, a great health behavior. Um, Non-daily smoking actually increases mortality risk by 72% compared to uh, never smokers. And so there are other health repercussions too. And it's also particularly common among vulnerable and disadvantaged groups like racial and ethnic minorities, people with mental health issues, and young adults. And so it's a health equity issue as well. So why uh, they built this this app is a or what is it really it is a participant facing mobile health app that is done completely on your smartphone it's a standalone tool that provides seven weeks of treatment in the app you get to do daily happiness exercises time tailored smoking cessation behavioral challenges and have some ad libitum tools such as reading resources um uh, smoking uh, cigarette trackers um options for what you could do instead of smoking and different scenarios and so forth. And it is based on uh, empirically tested positive psychology exercises, uses all the published guidelines for smoking cessation as outlined by the US clinical practice guidelines, and also in, uh, includes the six published recommendations for smoking cessation apps. And why do we do positive psychology? That seems like this kind of oddball thing in here. Well, our hypotheses were that positive psychology interventions would increase positive affect that if maintained or increased would increase the self-efficacy to refrain from smoking, decrease the defensive processing of self-relevant health information, reduce the desire or urge to smoke, and broaden the thought action repertoire, which means you just can, in the moment, think of more alternatives of what you could do instead of smoking, for example. And all of these mechanisms would then lead to smoking a successful smoking cessation. So uh, this is just the third in a series of iterative trials. We started our um, process with uh, local non-daily smokers in person, and we had 30 of them, and we had a basic working app for them, got lots of feedback and qualitative detailed interviews, revised our app to version two, then we used it in a larger online, online non-daily smoking trial and recruited 90 people. We got much more feedback, both quantitative markers and qualitative feedback, refined the app further, and then ran a proof of concept RCT in 226 
fully online recruited non-daily smokers. And in, uh, and I'll give you a little bit more detail about that trial. So in that trial, we have actually two control conditions. And what's remarkable is that they're both active controls. There is an existing smoking cessation app called Quit Guide, which is brought out by the National Cancer Institute, but it is for daily smokers, widely used, solid app, but it has never been tested as an evidence-based tool. So we also used what's called the standard of care, where people just hand smokers a brochure that's called clearing the air. It can be a PDF or a flyer, and um, that is the standard of care in most clinical practice. And so on both of those treatments were delivered over seven treatment weeks and had three to six months follow-up, although in this talk, I'll only talk about the end of treatment differences for now. And we picked as the primary outcome, self-efficacy to abstain from smoking. So why didn't I go for the obvious one with the uh, smoking abstinence? Well, those abstinence numbers are oftentimes fairly small and the differences aren't huge. So you need a much larger trial to show efficacy outcome on smoking cessation. But the first step is that people feel that they can refrain from smoking and that they feel confident that they can maintain the skills that they have learned. So that is the first uh, portion that we did as our primary outcome. We also looked at treatment acceptability and feasibilities in preparation for a larger efficacy trial that we are planning. And we have some exploratory outcomes, including uh, the 30-day point prevalence smoking abstinence and mechanisms of change, such as positive affect and craving. Jumping right into the results of the people, the inclusion criteria were just non-daily smoking adults in the United States who own a smartphone and are willing to make a quit attempt. No further exclusions of any kind. Uh, the results very briefly, the primary outcome was significant. Um, people in our app were had greater self-efficacy to refrain from smoking than both of the control conditions with a medium effect size. Uh, those are highlighted in blue in the table. The um, uh, positive affect and craving, which are, are our mechanisms, were also significantly um, improved with medium effect sizes. There were no client satisfaction differences, meaning that our control groups were very credible. And uh, lastly, there are some promising abstinence rates where all of the con uh, all of the conditions actually had fairly good or really good uh, abstinence rates, and our uh, app is uh, slightly higher in achieving high abstinence rates, but those differences will have to be tested in a full-fledged RCT. With that, I would like to uh, acknowledge our funders and thank them. The American Cancer Society funded all three trials. We had a really large team of dedicated research interns and collaborators. We thank them all for their participation. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Any questions from the audience for Suzanne? I just want to say this is really interesting. I've never thought about non-daily smokers before. So thank you for bringing that awareness. And I'm super curious, are you and Bethina related? <laughs> we, we are it's actually random. sisters, so yes, we are related. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Suzanne, I, I, only, I have a, one question about the daily smokers. Uh, um, uh, and maybe you, I missed that from your presentation. Um, what is the... Um, what is the hypothesis about uh, behind uh, focusing uh, intervention-wise on daily versus non-daily smokers? Um, should these mm -hmm. be different interventions? And what what is the theoretical uh, support uh, or hypothesis for that? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question. And the uh, primary difference is that for daily smokers, because they're nicotine dependent, uh, we do have a lot of treatments designed to address that nicotine dependence with patches, medications, CBT, and all that. But a lot of non-daily smokers don't feel that they're really addicted, and they find, or find it aversive to do those treatments. And they say, I don't know, I'm not really a smoker. I only do it occasionally, but they still do it. And many of them actually want to quit, but find it hard to quit. And so non-daily smokers, I mean, they could quit for up to three days and then smoke again. So they're not really non-smokers, but they don't consider themselves smokers. And so we try to make something that's attractive to them and meets them where they're at uh, in their behavior. Thank you so much for that. 
Um, moving on to presenter number three, um, we have uh, Mutsink uh, exploring the design of socially aware personal informatics technology for mental wellness. Uh, Stephen, please um, go ahead and. Is that working out? To... Yes. All right, great. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Steve Boyda. I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm presenting on a, a long running project called MoodSync on behalf of uh, co authors, uh, graduate students Tian Xu, Michael Hofer, and Esteban Sandoval. Um, so, as many of you know, serious mental illness is a really significant problem. It affects a huge number of people uh, at some point in their lives. Um, one particular serious mental illness that we think is uh, particularly challenging to design interventions for is bipolar disorder, which is characterized by fluctuations in mood, energy, and activity. Um, what we've seen from sort of the clinical side and talking with uh, clinical folks who are helping to uh, manage bipolar disorder is that um, tracking every day activities can help to improve outcome and minimize symptoms, getting a sense of regularity and figuring out where sort of the triggers to tip people into a depressive or manic phase um, can be really valuable information. And we know that people are, um, who are facing serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder are adapting off the shelf personal informatics tools as part of this self tracking, um, either by the recommendation of their caregivers and clinicians, or um, just they're finding tools online to, to be able to do that themselves. Um, so we did some initial qualitative work. We did interviews and focus groups with individuals who were um, diagnosed with BD and the close friends and family members who were helping them to manage um, BD. And we found three things that were really interesting. Um, first, personal informatics systems are commonly adapted and appropriated by individuals with SMI, um, but these systems are typically deployed from a single user perspective. It's one person's relationship with their data. Um, and this places significant burden on those who are doing this self-tracking to keep up with the data collection, make sense of what they're putting into the system. Um, it's extra overhead in a really complicated situation that already exists. And what these existing systems fail to do is to support collective data capture and sense-making activities. What do I mean by that? So uh, in a typical situation, somebody downloads an app to do self-tracking about you know, medication adherence, mood variations, potential triggers, um, sleep, activity, irritation levels. And some of that information is then um, used to either self-reflect on what's going on or become communication to a caregiver or a clinician. That's great. Um, what we're also seeing from talking to people is that there's these family members, these close members who are uh, also part of the equation, and they're sort of informing what goes into these systems. But it's, it's this forced um, situation where if the individual with bipolar disorder is not well enough to do the self-tracking, sometimes the spouse or roommate or parent will take over the tracking. Uh, sometimes there'll be gaps. Sometimes there'll be sort of interpretive work that goes on around these things. But there's not a really good situation for um, supporting this because it's one app with one database and, and it doesn't really support all of the interactions that are going on in the real world. So what we're proposing is a platform where each member of the caregiver network has their own access to um, the app for self-tracking around um, the individual who's managing bipolar disorder. These are connected together. Not all the data is necessarily shared on both sides, but it's one account that sort of embodies this whole ecosystem of, of self-tracking and care, which both uh, reinforces this notion of a relationship between the caregiver and the individual managing their mental illness, but it also provides increasing depth in um, self-reflection for how does the person who's trying to make sense of their mood and their activities, um, how, what, what should they put in there? I mean, one of the characteristics of bipolar disorder is you don't understand what your baseline is that you're tracking against. And so this potentially has uh, the, op or the opportunity to, to create a, a better sense of a baseline, a better sense of identity. So this is really a work in progress. Um, we're developing this, situ uh, this app right now and, and getting ready to do a, depl a deployment study on it this summer. Um, the primary thing that we're looking at is what happens with this, this idea of co-tracking. We've shown this to clinical partners. They're really excited about the idea that um, we're, we're giving all the members of this care group sort of a seat at the table and, and legitimizing their role in care. Um, and we're, that we've gotten some feedback that they think that this is really promising. Part of what we're interested in, in exploring with this is um, to what extent 
relevant is this kind of uh, co-tracking, putting stress on the existing relationship? How much is it enabling conversations to really foster understanding of what's going on with the mental illness and what the day-to-day -day experience is? Um, we're collecting a lot of qualitative information about that, and we're going to be really excited to hopefully share that with this group uh, in, in upcoming years. Um, the second thing that we're really interested in is this idea of how much a system like this can help to improve um, dynamic self-awareness. So for the individual who is managing their mental illness, um, when they are in the middle, when they are the euthymic self, uh, how much can they plan ahead to support the manic self um, when they're sort of thinking that they can do this all by themselves and, and they can get rid of the self-tracking or the depressed self, how can they can get themselves back to a, sort of a centered uh, state and what role that the data in these systems can play in those things. Um, so this is a project that's, uh, we have four co-authors here, but this really represents the work of a ton of graduate students and undergraduate students. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is the fact that um, this project has just attracted a huge amount of interest from students who really want to support um, their family members, their roommates, uh, individuals that they know who are wrestling with mental illness. Um, and we're really excited to hopefully um, count some of you as future collaborators on this project as we continue to push forward and share more about it. That's what I've got. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve, for this super interesting uh, presentation. The, uh, the, um... Any question from the audience for Steve? I have a quick question. Like, do you think there will be some sort of defensive processing when other people comment on, you know, the target person's mental state? And you're like, <laughs> I don't know. Are they, do they want that? Are they, you know, how are you going to be coping with that when they say right, you are so, really so... in a bad way? <laughs> <laughs> right. So so this is one of the things that we are both most concerned about, but also really excited about. Um, it, it's already happening. Right. So like there's already the sense of like I'm asking for help from a trusted group. So this is not just anybody. This is, you know, people who um, the individual who's uh, managing their mental wellness have identified as being uh, supportive. So the first thing that we're doing is we're recruiting really intentionally initially. Um, a, a lot of the energy around treating bipolar disorder at Colorado is uh, based on family-focused therapy, which is a treatment that was developed here at CU uh, by David Miklowitz and colleagues. Um, so we're recruiting from folks who are training to work with one another and sort of build shared goals around support um, as kind of our first foray. Um, we're also doing some really intentional design things about being able to um, say, well, I, I need to put this data point in about my, my friend, roommate, son, daughter. I don't want them to see it, but I want it to be part of this conversation with the clinician. So some filtering on how that information is shared. Um, but a lot of what we're doing is really close qualitative work to understand um, when is this um, supportive? When does it feel like surveillance? We, we, we don't want to impose that sense of surveillance, but like, what are the design aspects of this that we need to be the most careful about so that as we're starting with a sort of a small group of trained FFT um, adherents or, or clinical um, folks who are using that clinical approach, how do we then take those insights and then deploy it more generally so that folks who don't have necessarily that experience or background can have a really positive experience without feeling judged or uh, surveilled, which uh, we are keenly aware could be a potential problem in this situation. Thank, Thank you, Steve. You. Uh, I, I, sorry, I apologize for cutting um, such an interesting uh, exchange. Uh, we need to move uh, with Thank our you. presentations. So again, please um, uh, feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat. Actually, you, you got a positive comment about your slides uh, in there, Steve. So moving on to digital approach avoidance training as a treatment augmentation for obsessive compulsive disorder. We have uh, Martha uh, ready um, to go. Hi everyone. All right, can everybody see that? Okay, great. So I'm gonna be talking about approach avoidance training as uh, was just mentioned as a potential treatment augmentation for OCD. This is work we've been doing at McLean Hospital's OCD program and Olivia, who's also here is one of the people working on this. Okay, so I, sorry, I'm having problems with my, there we go. So most people probably know uh, that exposure and response prevention is the gold standard treatment for OCD, but what you may or may not know is that about half of people unfortunately don't actually recover after having this treatment. 
And so we've been looking for ways to potentially improve response rates. And one way we think might be effective is by targeting avoidance, so a very prominent impairing feature, but we don't know if you target direct avoidance directly on top of treatment, if this could help. So one way people have been targeting avoidance or also approach, depending on the issue, um, is through something called approach avoidance training. And an example of this is here on the right, uh, where you start off with a picture of something that someone is either trying to approach or avoid. Um, so in this case, the smoking is the thing the person's trying to avoid. Um, and you either push the image away to simulate avoidance because it's getting smaller from you. And in this case, there's a joystick. You could use a mouse or keys, all sorts of things. Or you could try to learn to approach the thing by pulling the picture towards you and the picture will get bigger. Um, and this has been done with a bunch of different clinical populations like smoking, alcohol, eating uh, disorders. Um, but then also uh, in OCD, there's been non-clinical samples with OC symptoms uh, that have been tested. And um, with the clinical sample, they did a standalone self-help online intervention. Um, so we wanted to know if we were to bring this to our intensive and residential OCD program uh, and targeted approach, could we possibly reduce avoidance and have improved outcomes for people? And we've done this in two different ways. Um, one is through the computer and a joystick, and the other is a smartphone. So an example of what this would look like on a computer, you learn to approach the picture here with toilet full of urine. Um, so we did this on the computer with about, uh, not with about, with 12 people. Um, and most of them were non-Hispanic white females who are heterosexual mostly and um, uh, on the younger side. And we had people select which photos were triggering for them in terms of contamination and which were neutral. We had them do eight of these training sessions with the approach avoidance across a month, measured reaction times and their OCD symptoms um, before and after. And we wanted to know, first of all, was this even a feasible thing to do during an intensive residential program? And um, COVID did interfere, so we, we don't have um, the data for this that we want to have, but from what we can tell, if uh, COVID had not happened, perhaps only one of 12 people stopped short of completing all of the trainings. Um, so obviously we need to do more work on that. Um, but we were able to get exit interviews from everybody, and we found that most people found the program helpful and user-friendly, and they gave us really great feedback. Like, it gave me more awareness as to what I was capable of or made me look at triggers I don't normally look at. Um, and we found that for if it was measuring what we hoped it was measuring, people did approach contamination images slower than neutral, but same, same direction for, for push which was surprising. So we need to look into that more. Um, this pattern has been found before though with other studies. And um, the indices people normally look at are pull and push bias. So um, just the first uh, baseline we saw, um, it basically that for pull bias, people were having a greater difficulty approaching threat and a greater avoidance of threat than they were um, four sessions later. Um, so you can see that the direction went in the expected uh, expected way, which was good, but they were also receiving treatment at the same time, and we didn't have a control group, so we can't say that's why. So then, as I said, COVID happened in the middle. We have started to adapt this to a smartphone. Um, we've run into some technological glitches, so we don't have um, a ton of people to present on. Uh, but I wanted to at least put forth the concept of this really cool thing where you're approaching through bringing the phone towards yourself and pushing away by push it, by moving the phone away. Um, we've been adapting it by making shorter sessions that are just a couple of minutes because a phone, you'd want shorter sessions than the computer. Um, for the people we've had so far, we found similar effects to the computer um, where approach is what we expected, but not necessarily for avoidance. People told us it's user-friendly. Um, so we found that both of these methods seem to be feasible and acceptable. Um, we need to make sense of the results a little more. Uh, obviously there's a small N, no control group, and there's limited diversity in our sample. Um, and we will be, uh, oops, my, that's my alarm. Um, we'll be resuming doing the computerized uh, version. We'll add a control group. Looking for any advice about smartphone AATs, if anyone knows of any. Um, and recruiting hopefully from more diverse sample. So thank you to everybody who worked on this. Thank you, Martha. That was, that was uh, really great and very effective slides too. Um, Thanks. And, and can I just say that uh, being a um, person focused on uh, digital health for LGBTQ people, I'm super excited to see people including 
uh, sexual and or gender minorities uh, and keeping track of that uh, in their uh, in your in your work. Um, that is super uh, exciting uh, to me. Um, do people have questions for Martha at this point? I do. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, you might have covered this and I missed it, but um, do you see um, an opportunity for people to maybe take their own pictures of things that are the most triggering to them in their life and in their daily context and then incorporate that into the app to make it kind of as ecologically valid as possible? Or do you think that would be too tricky? I definitely want to do that. Um, and I know that one of our coworkers had done this with kids uh, where they did the did an AT with kids. It's not published yet. Um, one thing that's a little tricky for us is everybody is, well, except for the intensive people, but most people are at the program. So we thought if we took pictures of things around the unit, they might be working oh, yeah. on like the toilets, that that would be kind of an easier logistical way to do that. But then when COVID happened, it was like, what we got, we had to actually move units. So now our pictures aren't even the current place and most people were virtual. And so we have to rethink that anyway. So um, it's definitely something we should consider because I think it would be a lot more ecologically valid. Thanks for the Thanks. idea. Martha, I have a follow-up question. Um, so you're conceiving these as of right now as an augmentation uh, treatment. Um, have you or your team uh, thought of it as a potential um, um, tool that could be used uh, by by patients uh, while they wait until uh, their first visit, for example? And do you do you foresee differences in the approach if you if you ever uh, were considering doing that? My dream would be that people could be doing this program at home actually uh, in rural areas who don't necessarily have access. And so that in general, it's just sort of an app anyone could use actually, not just as a treatment augmentation, but the caveat I'm worried about is that it might be really hard for people who haven't been with a therapist yet to work on this because it's so challenging for people to look at these pictures. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd really love to hear them because um, I, I struggle with that. I and mean, that was, one person had said so far, actually, it was challenging to do it this early in treatment by themselves. Thank you. Thank you. I just muted myself. Uh, let's move on to our last presenter uh, this afternoon. Um, this will be about translating evidence-based interventions into engaging digital innovations for at-risk populations in the real world, insights and recommendations from decade creating digital mental health products with academia and industry. Um, so uh, um, Ryan, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, afternoon, everyone, happy to be here joining you from sunny Arizona. Um, I'm Dr. Ryan Stoll, I'm, in, I'm an implementation scientist and university product manager and also serve as one of the managing partners of Humanity by Design, an organization that's committed to creating engaging and effective digital interventions for public health with academia and industry. Um, over the last 15 years, we all know we've seen an extraordinary shift in the mental health intervention landscape with the fusion of mental health science and technology, bringing a wave of access, solutions, collaborations, and public benefits that were not otherwise possible before. This fusion has also introduced a number of new challenges that we must address if we're to fully realize this potential of digital mental health uh, and these challenges include things like low adoption and response rates in the real world, such as low engagement, not showing up and, you know, actually using the technologies and the content, not responding very well, both clinically, but on a use case, but also seeing compromised effectiveness of these digital tools as they're deployed into everyday settings and as we're beginning to look to scaling these programs up and out from their point of development. Um, the one thing when an area that we've seen in our work over the last decade, both creating digital mental health programs within academia, as well as serving as the product development team for industry projects, 
is the core role of human-centered design in bridging these gaps and addressing these challenges that are facing the field of digital mental health today. At its most fundamental level, design shapes external environments to influence internal experiences to empower a specific set of behaviors that can lead to whatever those desired outcomes are. So from this perspective, we come to view design as an invisible but potent force that we can harness to address these challenges and begin creating digital mental health innovations that are highly engaging, responsive to the end use context, and can be adequately, adequately scaled up in real world environments such that communities achieve and receive the benefits they rightly deserve. Um, Human-centered design, just very briefly, offers a well-established framework, methodology, and it's an umbrella set of tools that really at the core places users and stakeholders' needs, behaviors, experiences, and unique perspectives at the forefront of problem-solving and solution-building efforts. One main aim of human-centered design across the board, regardless of the stage of the product, is to understand the specific parameters and ingredients necessary for creating an intervention or program that both fits the delivery context, addresses the core challenge at hand, and that users can experience as functional, efficient, and enjoyable. We've used, we use several human-centered design strategies in our work, and a number of you that have spoken today have referenced some of these, either directly or indirectly, uh, which really makes me excited to, to hear and see. Um, but two that I'm really gonna highlight today and with the time that we have are co-creation and storyfication. And I'm gonna walk through very briefly what they are, how they can be used, and how we've applied them in our work in creating digital mental health programs and what we've been able to do in terms of scalability as a proxy for this is actually something that people can use and we can bring out to the communities at a larger scale. The, so co-creation involves uh, stakeholders throughout the product creation process and involving them at key decision points in whatever you're producing. The goal here is to be able to leverage the various stakeholder groups that are often very complex and multi-level with digital mental health interventions in order to leverage their unique insights, understandings, and perspectives as a means of gaining a deeper understanding as to how you can best translate the science into things that meet people's needs and their end user preferences. Co-creation was pivotal for us in developing Compass for Courage. Compass is a school-based and gamified anxiety prevention program for children that can be implemented digitally or in person. Uh, in the initial development work of Compass a few years ago and during our uh, digital implementation adaptation project that we engaged in at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we work closely with our research colleagues at Arizona State University and, and our community stakeholders through social network analysis to identify popular opinion leaders, running needs assessments to understand what is your ideal anxiety prevention program look like for your school, continuing with community advisory boards throughout the whole process, focus groups, and of course, one of my favorite is running ongoing prototype feedback sessions with community stakeholders across and throughout the, the process. The knowledge gained from our co-creative efforts with Compass really provided us with a community-driven roadmap on how we can package well-established CBT strategies into various streamlined and media-rich programs that both schools and youth would view favorably and the results would, would, uh, would emerge. And after uh, an RCT conducted across nine Arizona schools that confirmed both its usability and its uh, effectiveness, We've since been able to expand Compass to over 50 schools across the state, which we attribute largely to the continued involvement with our original co-creative team that continues to champion and advocate for the program, even as they leave and change schools, districts, and communities. And this continued co-creative effort, both from the relationships we developed and the knowledge uh, gained also helped us launch uh, Compass, the Compass Materials 
at no cost nationwide to parents and schools on PBS learning media with relatively small adaptations to the existing content because the communities knew what they needed and we were able to just combine those two uh, to produce something that uh, at this point more than 10,000 students have received to date. The second human-centered design strategy I'm gonna highlight is storification. Now, storification a little bit differently uh, and this embeds story-driven elements into products to create more uh, media-rich, resident, engaging user experiences. Uh, storification is central to our role as the lead technology development and media production team for a project led out of, uh, led by Dr. Zadie Weaver, Joe Himley, and now Zhang at the University of Michigan called Entertain Me Well. Entertain Me Well is a web platform that delivers CBT through character-driven storylines that introduce and reinforce core concepts and show how they can be applied in everyday life. One EMW intervention, one of our favorite, is focused on depression. It features Billy the Balloon, whose storylines are embedded within each intervention session like an episode of a television show and is presented in a similar fashion like The Office or Parks and Rec if you're familiar. What we've seen in initial evaluations of the platform um, beyond confirming- We're almost on time. Okay. Uh, well, beyond the evaluations, they've confirmed both the effect efficacy, but also the engagement and responsiveness of the platform overall. Um, I'll just, I'll just wrap up with the two slides I have real quick. Design is a crucial element here in the digital era. And if we're to achieve the promise of our science and the investments, and progress made to date, then we need to begin designing digital mental health products to meet the baseline user experiences that people are so used to, particularly as our technologies exist on phones right next to streaming media and entertainment applications. So human-centered design offers those strategies to help begin translating that science into those products and represents a frontier that we should begin, and I hope and invite you all to begin exploring this frontier as you build the future of digital mental health. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we're almost um, at our time. Um, is there any question from the audience for Ryan? Okay. Thank you all so much for attending this session. Uh, and um, please uh, continue to enjoy uh, our conference for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you all.